Just let me know once that's done, because it takes about a second or two for it to do that. Okay, now, now we're ready. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for uh, uh, the thermodynamics uh, block with Optomechanics. I'm very, very excited to uh, have our first uh, seminar out of two. And we have a lineup of really um, amazing speakers and, and, and really exciting research that you'll be hearing from um, in the course of the next uh, this week and next week. Um, so without further ado, let me start by introducing our first speaker. And, and he really doesn't need any introduction. Um, I think everyone here will know him. But in any case, I'm going to try to embarrass him and do introduce him. <laughs> so Mauro um, uh, is, uh, is, of course, a professor at uh, Queen's University of Belfast. Um, he actually received his PhD um, from the same university um, in theoretical quantum information processing. Um, after receiving a research fellow um, at uh, University of Vienna, he then was awarded um, uh, an APCRC Career Acceleration Fellowship back and, and went back to Queen's uh, back in 2008. Um, and uh, so now he currently is a, is a reader there and a lecturer, and he co-leads the Quantum Technologies Group. Um, and it goes without saying that his research interest spans pretty much everything um, and, and beyond optomechanics. Um, and including, of course, uh, the topic that we've uh, requested him to give us a brief introduction to, um, that being thermodynamics and non-equilibrium physics. So without further ado, um, Mauro, um, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Mundasa. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for, for having me, um, for having me again at one of the unicorn, unicorn seminars. So um, I'm going to um, be uh, much more interactive than, than what I'm typic I typically am with uh, when giving a talk. So I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully it works okay. And I'm going to um, uh, actually present what I say the topic of the discussion on, uh, on my tablet. And I'm um, very low tech, so I apologize. It's not, a, it's not an iPad, uh, it's say a Wacom one, so it's uh, sort of crappish, but I hope it will be sufficiently um, say, uh, useful to illustrate the points of the discussion. So um, Mudasa and the guys at Unicorn asked me for a very, um, say, um, um, say some, so a form of overview of um, non-equilibrium thermodynamics, which is going to be um, the topic, the main topic of today's um, discussion. And um, I hope that I can spell at least. And, um, and I'm going to focus on optomechanics um, for uh, context, okay? So can I check with one of the organizers if my handwriting is sort of decent, okay? So readable, and if you can't see in particular, if you can't see what I'm writing, is that okay? Yes, it's fine. That's great, okay. So, um, Let's start, so not, not that I'm going to write much, but it's mo mostly going to be um, a bit of, of doodling, but uh, uh, starting from now already. So um, let's say the following. Uh, suppose that uh, this blob here is your favorite, if you, is your favorite system, is your favorite quantum system, whether this is say an atom or a collection of uh, modes, mechanical modes or a big Bose-Einstein condensate, um, or, a, or a piece of, of, of condensed matter, whatever, is your favorite system. And let's highlight, which is the say, most uh, frequent situation that we encounter in any of our, of our quantum labs. Okay, so very much likely what is going to happen um, is the following. Your system is going to be probably driven from um, outside by some pump, um, putting energy into the system itself, modifying the energy H, not the Hamiltonian of your system, um, in certain time. So um, I'm, I'm making my, my energy a time, an explicitly time-dependent quantity. And also, if I want uh, to have any, any uh, say, uh, uh, realism in, my in the description of my, of my system, I have to feed into my description, also the effect of an environment. 
And um, typically uh, what happens is that this environment has its own temperature T uh, at, which, um, at which it operates. So strictly speaking, um, what am I dealing with when I arrange for um, a typical um, of, say a typical experiment in a, in, a, in, a, in a lab is nothing else but a, a thermodynamical system. Okay, so thermodynamics enter into, um, into uh, the, um, uh, say, somehow the business very, very, very uh, naturally. I have uh, energy exchange processes occurring at the level of the pumping process itself. I have energy exchange processes that occur at the level of the contact between my system and its environment. So um, what I can do is interpreting the dynamics that my system um, goes through in terms of the laws of thermodynamics. So why, why not? The, the complication or the difficulty is the following. Uh, all I want, so I would like um, uh, the dynamics to occur in at finite time. I would like uh, to be fast. Uh, certainly faster um, the, um, that, than the environment. Okay. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, I want to, um, apologies for any spelling mistake. Uh, I think and write at the same time. And when you do it on a tablet, it's particularly difficult for me. Sorry for that. But um, uh, wh what do I mean by uh, I would like to be faster than the environment? I mean that if I have any request for processing information quantum mechanically, and if I am trying to uh, develop and manage some piece of um, quantum technology, right? So something that exploits quantum features, then um, I would like the environment uh, to be unable to ruin completely the party. And therefore, I would like to, uh, to be driving my system and manipulating it fast. And this key, this sorry, this word is key uh, because fast is um, enemy of an enemy for thermodynamics. Uh, open any, um, any book that you, any textbook in thermodynamics. And what you, what you get in that context, what you achieve in that, so the first, probably the first uh, notion that you have to learn by opening any book in thermodynamics is that you have to actually be quite, quite slow, quite gentle in manipulating your system. Any process has to um, require a quasi-static transformation, nature of your transformation, okay? So thermodynamics likes um, quasi-static. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean that at every uh, time in the evolution of my system S, I must be able to define pressure, volume, temperature of my system. And if I'm too fast, this cannot be the case. So is, this is not necessarily the case. So it seems that we have um, a dichotomy here. On one hand, I want to run an experiment and I want to run dynamics in um, uh, according to the, so to say, the prescriptions of quantum, um, uh, uh, quantum technology, which means let me be quick, let me be um, uh, uh, an enemy of, for my environment. So let's not give it a chance to ruin to ruin my dynamics. On the other hand, um, when I do that, and I realize yet that I'm in the presence of energetics and energy exchange processes, then um, I'm a little bit in trouble because I cannot really rely on the standard laws of thermodynamics as I know them. Lucky enough, I mean, a framework for the study of such fast processes from a thermodynamic viewpoint has been developed. And this is the framework of stochastic thermodynamics, okay? Um, uh, what do I um, mean by, by this is that I can generalize uh, the laws of thermodynamics to a framework where my transformations are explicitly and declaredly not quasi-static. Which are the implications? The implications are quite a few. And in fact, um, um, say the very foundations of, of the framework of thermodynamics has to be, has to be rethought re or reconsidered. So what I'm going to do in page two is for instance, to illustrate 
uh, which is the general the general situation that I'm going to that I'm going to consider, or that is say generally speaking considered when dealing with uh, stochastic thermodynamics, whether you are dealing with a classical but fast process or with a quantum a quantum one. Uh, in the in the general framework of stochastic thermodynamic, for instance, you might be interested in extracting work by acting through a fast process on your quantum system. Okay, so I'm I'm drawing a simplified version of my system and environment. So what I did, what I do, what I'm assuming is that my system is initially in contact, in perfect contact with the temp with the environment at a temperature T. Maybe the environment can be again red as I, as I drew it in the previous in the previous page. Okay, so um, and this establishes basically a thermal equilibrium state rho naught of my system. Okay, um, at, at the initial time T equal to zero of my process. Okay, then I go forward. Okay, so I go forward by. Uh, detaching, so the second step in my in my in my thought experiment goes through the detaching of my of my system S from the environment, and this is the active part or starts to be the active part of my of my process. What I'm wondering is, okay, uh, if I perform a measurement on my on my system, right? So, and this is my uh, theoretician sketch. Of a detector, right? So, um, how much is the chance p of finding my system in the nth physical configuration, energy configuration of, of that is available to it at this instant of time? Okay, so that's the probability to find the system um, at t equal to zero. Okay, so um, or zero plus immediately after I've, I've detached it from the environment in the nth energy eigenstates. Of, uh, of its Hamiltonian, of its Hamiltonian age. Okay. Third step, and this is the part where I'm actually doing work on the system, or I'm asking the system to do work for me, right? So I subject my system S to some action. Okay. So I change the Hamiltonian from H to a new Hamiltonian, H dash. Now I get my my wrench and I I crank it up. Um, changing its energy. Okay, so that's the active part that will change the energy of my system from H to H dash. And after that, I let a little. So this is really uh, what I get in a in a period of time from zero plus to a final time tau, which is the end of my of my process. So this is where the active bit of my of my experiment. In the end, what I do is that I interrogate the system again. Okay, so the environment is no longer particularly helpful, so I can uh, avoid drawing it. But I perform a second measurement at this stage. Okay, so another detector, and this time I wonder what is the probability that I find my system in a new energy eigenstate p. Uh, let's call it pk. Uh, my um, Right, so my students always complain about my handwriting. Given that a time tau, given that a time t equal to zero, I found it in the nth energy eigenstate of its of its Hamiltonian. Okay, so um, what I'm what I'm doing in a in a strictly cartoonish manner is to start from my thermal equilibrium state at the beginning of my process evolve in time through a trajectory, a dynamical trajectory for a time tau, okay? And this is um, my arrow of time t, um, for a time tau until when, no, until which point, until point, see, yeah, uh, this final point, I wonder, okay, in which state um, k of the new Hamiltonian h dash, my system is, given that at t equal to zero, I found it through my first measurement in the nth eigenstate of H. During this period of time, I'm performing work. How much is this work? Okay, so why am I performing work? Because I'm changing the Hamiltonian. No, I've done something, I've driven my system, I've changed its energy. So um, how much am I work am I performing? Well, if I if I run these, uh, say, it's basically just the change, the change in expectation value of the Hamiltonian uh, from H 
to H dash. Uh, but these quantity will pretty much depend on how I'm running the experiment. And if I run it another time and another time and another time, I'm going to uh, start from different points every time and end up at different points every time, simply because the measurements that I perform quantum mechanically only have a probabilistic outcome. So the probabilistic nature, oh, probabilistic, sorry. <laughs> the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics play, yes, plays a crucial role um, in this game um, in determining basically, um, which is the chance that I end up in the K energy against state of the final Hamiltonian, given that I was there at the beginning, uh, that I was in, in the nth energy against state at the beginning of my, of my process. So what I realize is that work becomes a stochastic variable in this context. I apologize, one of my rather large dogs is starting, uh, started barking, apologies for that. So it's a probabilistic quantity um, uh, that uh, depends, depends on the trajectory. Um, probabilistic quantity, uh, let's write it, uh, trajectory dependent. Cool. So I have a distribution of work. I don't have um, a deterministic value anymore. On one end, I have an element of indeterminism that comes from the thermal nature of the initial state of my system. On the other hand, I have an element of uh, um, proba see, uh, a probability coming from the quantum nature of the measurement that I'm performing and the dynamics that I'm performing. So um, the two conspire to take work and change it into, into a distribution. So I can only talk about a, st a statistical uh, distribution for work, and you can extend it to it, okay? So you can generalize to heat, meaning the energy that, uh, if I go back to the first page, the energy that my system exchanges with its environment in time, if I let the two guys interact all the time rather than the touching system and environment at some point in my, in my dynamics, well, the energy that the two systems will exchange over time will become a stochastic, a probabilistic, a random variable that will, risk, will, will follow, will um, satisfy a given, a given distribution. So um, averages, average quantities are what matters, okay? So, and um, uh, variances become uh, incredibly uh, important in this framework for stochastic thermodynamics that I'm, I'm, I'm drawing up. Um, which are the fixed points? So which are the points uh, that I can uh, rely upon or the statements that I can rely upon? Okay, so um, fundamental relations that, uh, a fundamental relation that I um, can rely on is uh, the so-called Yazinski identity, okay? So let's go to um, the following. Uh, so page four, I guess. And um, so Yazinski is a um, crucial statement that uh, states that basically, if I take the expectation value of a many trajectories of my dynamics, of the exponential of minus, uh, let's call it, let's call it like this. The work that I do in every trajectory at the temperature of my environment, well, this quantity is exactly equal to minus the change in free energy at the time, at the temperature T. So this is free energy. And um, what does it, so why is this relation so important? Well, this is important because on one end, apologies for this, I'm not interested in that. So on one end, I have an explicitly stochastic quantity, the work that I'm performing trajectory by trajectory. This is what I have illustrated badly in page two. And I'm taking the average through stochastic trajectory it is that my system follows in light of the probabilistic nature of the, problems, the, the process itself, the non-quasi-static nature of the process itself. 
On the other hand, I have something defined, very well defined at equilibrium, which is the change in free energy, which makes sense only at equilibrium, okay? So, or between equilibrium points. So, Yajinsky identity is actually incredibly important because it allows you to relate non-equilibrium properties of your stochastic thermodynamic framework of, say, for instance, work extraction or heat exchange to very well-defined equilibrium properties of your system in the hypothetical case where your system would be would end up at equilibrium. So uh, again, making use of a, of a cartoon, if I start from my equilibrium point at t equal to zero, I go through a trajectory until a time t equal to tau, I end up in row of tau, which is not necessarily an equilibrium, an equilibrium state, okay? Um, it depends on my process. If my process is very fast, there is no chance for me to be in, at equilibrium. Well, uh, but I can relate to the hypothetical equilibrium state at time tau for the new Hamiltonian H dash of my system and define my change in free energy delta F between these two points. Well, the work that I'm able to perform in this trajectory will be related to the change in free energy between these two, uh, I say one very physical and very well defined and one very hypothetical and not necessarily achieved equilibrium point of my dynamics. All this framework for stochastic thermodynamics has an incredibly, um, um, an incredible consequence. And the consequence is, is the following, right? So the consequence is that if I consider Clausius law, okay, the uncompensated um, uh, transformation that I achieve when I perform a transformation of a thermodynamic nature on a system. Well, what I have is that um, focus is, I should focus on the change in entropy of my system resulting from the transformation that I've implemented, whether a static, a quasi-static one, or a very fast and not, um, say, thermodynamically well-defined one as the, those that we are considering right now. Well, this change in entropy of my system is only lower bound by the total amount of energy, let me call it like this, and this might be heat or his work, that you exchange at the temperature T uh, of, of your environment. So the fact that here you have uh, an inequality is crucial, is key. Uh, the equality sign is only achieved and, and possible when you work in through quasi-static transformation. So basically going through quasi-equilibrium states of the process. Um, when you are in, instead very, very nasty and kick, and, and kick the system hard, as I did, well, uh, the inequality sign is there and you have a very pronounced unbalance between the change in entropy of your system and the amount of energy that you exchange with the environment that surrounds you. We don't like inequalities, so how do we make the left-hand side of these Clausius relations? So it's the second law, basically. Let me write it, okay? So second law. Um, how do we uh, relate the, um, this formulation of the second law and make it, how do we manipulate it and make it an equality? Well, what we need to do is to introduce a quantity, which is so-called entropy production. So um, basically uh, in any non-equilibrium transformation, you know, in any, say in any process in the stochastic framework for thermodynamics, the uncompensated difference between the amount of energy that you exchange with the environment and the change in entropy of your system defines an entropy produced through the system itself, okay, or by the system, by the system itself. So the um, key point, so to say, the take-home message that we, uh, that we have so far are the following. Say thermodynamic quantities, uh, let's, let me write it in, uh, uh, a slightly faster way. So thermodynamics, thermodynamical quantities are stochastics, sto uh, stochastic, right? Quantities um, are stochastic or probabilistic. And you have entropy production. 
and you cannot give away no you cannot go on without any of of these of these two of these two take home messages right why is this um relevant for the framework of optomechanics okay and and um the uh, again so the uh, uh the intuition comes from um a cartoon and uh, i'm sure that juliet will go into some of the details about about what i'm going to illustrate and um, in much more technical technical uh, uh with much more technical details itself so uh let's assume no a standard optomechanical system okay so i'm an old fashioned man so apologies for that let's say that we have a standard double clamped cantilever okay so something that gets kicked by a pumped uh fabri -Pero cavity and starts vibrating okay so this guy oscillates oscillates due to the optomechanical coupling um uh induced by by its interaction with light circulating inside inside this 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 fabri -Pero cavity what do we have then oh, well um i have an environment certainly here right so i have a cavity that leaks at a rate kappa into a very cold environment, which is the electromagnetic, the electromagnetic environment. On the other hand, <clears throat> I have phonon exchange processes at a rate gamma that my uh, double clamped cantilever uh, might undergo due to the fact that it's attached to stuff. And if you are instead a fan of or a supporter of levitated optomechanics, as you should, well, you can replace the say the the interact no the phononic uh, uh, the phononic mechanism the mechanism for exchange of phonons uh, due to the contact with the substrate at the back of my uh, optomecha of my mechanical system with scattering of um, uh, no excitations with the environment surrounding the levitated nanoparticle air around it uh, the fact that you have a non-zero temperature and that um, induces Brownian motion, uh, Brownian motion of your mechanical system. So you basically have a situation that looks a little bit like the following. No? So you have um, a, an harmonic oscillator. Well, let, let me draw it in, in red, apologies. So you have a, a mechanical oscillator. So this is the mechanics coupled in black to an optical oscillator, again in red which is the light. And each of them is in contact locally with its own environment. There is a cold electromagnetic environment um, uh, with which my cavity interacts at a rate kappa. Let's call G the optomechanical coupling strength here. And you have a uh, probably warm environment, uh, phonons, let's, let, um, let me call it like this with which my mechanical oscillator interacts at a rate gamma. And now, um, take all the time that you want. There is no way in which this system will reach an equilibrium for the very same reason that um, these two environments have uh, very different temperatures, okay? So I might have a transport process, but there is certainly no chance that I'm going to achieve an equilibrium state for my system. So um, for my optomechanical system, the best that I can conclude, and uh, Mudasa, I, I, I promise that I am uh, five minutes from the end, so there should be plenty of time for questions. Um, the best that you can achieve is that um, the optomechanical system um, goes to a non-equilibrium um, steady state into a non-equilibrium steady state. What does it mean? This means that um, there is no chance in which the optomechanical system itself will be a sim say, uh, uh, comparable to a thermal state of any, at any temperature. What does it mean? in terms of, of stochastic thermodynamics itself. It means that I should expect entropy production all the way. Given that I have a um, non-equilibrium process, 
that allows these two subsystems, the mechanics and the optics, to interact in time, exchanging energy at a rate G. The light interacting, so the, the optical part of my, of my device to interact with an environment at, a, at some temperature, the fact that it is virtually at zero temperature is only incidental, so to say, or accidental. And a non-zero temperature environment in contact with my, my, my mechanical subsystem induces an exchange of, of excitations here, here, and between the two sub parties coherently coupled, so quantum mechanically coupled, um, that takes the overall system into a non-equilibrium steady, steady state associated with some entropy production. The question is, can I go, I mean, all that is fine, I mean, and I can make it quantitative um, up to any degree of, of detail and accuracy, but is it relevant? What I mean is, um, can I measure it? So can I see it in some way? Can I go into the lab and actually get, not poke my system thermodynamically, uh, let's say, uh, witness the production of, of entropy um, um, due to the non, non, say, the, the, the non quasi static transformation that I am subjecting my system to? Can I basically witness? the stochastic thermodynamic framework, this non-equilibrium thermodynamic framework that I'm, um, I'm, I'm trying to very, very inaptly illustrate in these in this few, few minutes. Um, the answer is that, uh, yes, for an optomechanical system, yes, yes, in the, in the linearized regime, at least um, in the linearized regime uh, of optomechanics, uh, this is not only possible, but it has been done, and um, um, so, um, I was lucky enough to be part of the first experiment test, say, witnessing um, entropy production in an optomechanical system um, um, at, the experimental, at the experimental level. And when I say that this is possible in the linearized regime of optomechanics, um, I don't mean or I don't intend to exclude the possibility that in the, say, single photon optomechanical regime, we cannot witness um, or we cannot devise a way, a strategy, a protocol, an approach for witnessing entropy production. It is certainly um, uh, doable. It's just that the non-Gaussian nature of the single photon optomechanical coupling uh, complicates things a bit, but I will become incredibly more technical if I go through that. Um, while I just want to keep things at a very, very uh, high level and simply state that um, the entropy, you now if you go through uh, the analysis of entropy production in, in the details that it needs, it needs to be uh, to, to feed into this framework, you can, um, you can prove that the entropy production that you achieve in this context is basically proportional to the rate at which your cavity field um, loses energy to the environment times the mean energy of the cavity plus a contribution that comes from uh, the phononic environment, so to say, and the rate at which the energy is exchanged between the system and the environment itself, times the mean energy of the mechanics. And um, all my experimentalist friends in the, in the audience and all the, all the guys that have worked with an experiment in optomechanics know that these quantities are not only uh, uh, accessible, but are indeed the quantities that you, um, you, you are interested in tackling um, when dealing with, uh, with an, optomechanical, an optomechanical setting. These are the two quantities that you want to measure in order to prove, for instance, the radiation pressure-based cooling of your mechanical system induced by the coherent light coupling um, to, uh, to, the, to, the, um, to, the, to the environment. Um, so the again, in terms of take-home messages, is that um, when I look at the interplay between optomechanics and uh, non-equilibrium, and I write it as NE thermodynamics, um, not only there is uh, a lot to learn from, okay, so, but it's uh, observable, see, with caveats, and uh, the caveat that I'm putting forward in this in these 30 minutes 
or that I've put forward in these 30 minutes is basically the linearized regime of the interaction. With caveats, this is observable. Is controllable in the sense um, that I can play with one of the ingredients that I stated in the in the doodle in first in the first page of my of my of my notes, which is the pump, the way I perform the driving process itself, or if I uh, refer to my optomechanical sketch, the way I feed light into into the cavity. The control can be in the form of the shape duration and amplitude of pulses, bursts of light that I can use to drive the dynamics of my mechanical system through its coupling with the cavity field. Um, and the control uh, is not only in terms of, um, say, which is the steady state, the non-equilibrium steady state into which I'm driving my, op my uh, optomechanical device, but also in terms of how much entropy I produce in this in this context so i'm driving i can play with the control that i have the knobs that i have in my optomechanical system to drive the mechanical oscillator to a desired state with a desired degree of um, entropy production and the recommendation and and with that i'm done um is just to play with that okay um there is plenty of literature uh, around and uh, I'm sure that Janine, will, uh, sorry, that um, uh, Juliet will touch upon some of these of these features and some of the pieces of literature related to that. Um, there is plenty of literature that you can play with. There is plenty to play with, and there is a lot of fun to 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 have, both in terms of what you know in terms of optomechanics and the sort of things that you can learn from the non-equilibrium framework itself. Okay, guys, um, with that, I think my time is up. I, there should be um, 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 time for a few a few questions, hopefully. I hope it was, say, readable, Mudassar. Yes, no, it was um, it was readable. Thank you. Thank you, Mara, for, for, for that um, introduction and, and very thought-provoking, actually, uh, connections. Uh, some things that I've not thought about in the past, uh, especially in the context of levitated systems. Um, we do have a few questions, um, and we'll start with that. Um, so, Sophia, I don't know if you want to uh, open your mic and ask directly. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> hi, Mara. Thank you so much for, 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 the, for the talk. Sophia. Um, hi, nice to see you. So I, I was wondering about like, so, so, so these notions of entropy to production and the, the noise and environments that we're talking about, are they, are they valid for, are these notions valid for both Markovian and non-Markovian noise? Cool. Uh, and, and, and like, could, could non-Markovian noise, like, it's probably harder, but could it lead to, to some interesting opportunities as well? Absolutely. Uh, a very good question. Um, the answer is yes, they are valid in both the Markovian and non-Markovian environment, the only, or, or, or dynamics. The only um, uh, caveat, and, 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 and it's a very important one, is that uh, the laws of thermodynamics and what you expect from the arrow of time in terms of entropy production um, uh, seems to privilege a Markovian environment. What I mean is that oh. through non-Markovian dynamics, you can have some, um, let me say, so, say challenging statements that you can make, like uh, uh, for instance, say uh, um, uh, an arrow of time that can be, can be reversed through uh, through oh. coupling through in the independent yeah yeah and this is simply simply due to the fact that basically what you need to do is to reformulate entropy production uh, in a way that accounts for the Markovian nature of your of your evolution. So the short answer is that you can build a framework for Markovian stochastic non say stochastic or non equilibrium thermodynamic of quantum processes that is fully consistent with the second law, which cannot and should not be broken, mm -hmm. uh, but you need to reformulate and, and, and introduce thermodynamic quantities in an appropriate manner. Okay. Okay, that's a lot to think about. Yeah, no, thank you so much. No I problem. I had to think about that. Thank you, Mara and uh, Sophia for that question. Um, if you are watching on YouTube and if you have questions, please do send them through and we'll ask them. Um, so while we're waiting, I think we probably have time for two more, but I'll, I'll ask one anyway. Um, so Mara, this is more very basic question really. And, and, I, and I was thinking about when you were talking about this connection between the mechanics and the, the light 
and and especially in the context of levitated systems, you know, the, the particle is oscillating, um, and and there's an element of work being done by the motion of the particle and okay. um, by light on the particle. And and the thing that I it's quite hard to wrap your head around, and maybe you can sort of clarify is how is the how, what does work on photon mean by the motion of the particle in, in terms of what does that mean to the photon or what's that doing? Okay, so uh, the um, um, uh, the Hamiltonian of your so if you reinterpret the optomechanical Hamiltonian in terms uh, say from the viewpoint of 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 light, right? So mm. including including the optomechanical the optomechanical interaction, you have a shift in the in the uh, basically no in the in the in the frequency of your of your of, of your optical field induced by induced say dependent by uh, dependent on the position of your mechanical of your mechanical oscillator so you do have work a work contribution so to say to the um, um to um the dynamics of the of the light inside the cavity which you should be able to track down what is the complication the complication is that your um work uh, uh, so the, the, the element, the, the object that induces work on your cavity is a quantum mechanical system itself, right? So is the mechanical, is the, not, say, the levitated particle, for instance, or my, my double clamped cantilever. Um, so uh, while you affect, uh, while actually, while the mechanical system affects your work fluid, right? So the cavity, um, uh, there is also, a, say, a back action from the, cavity to the mechanical oscillator, needless to say, right? So the two objects become intertwined and that complicates your thermodynamic description. So you cannot treat it as an external pump changing the energy of the cavity field, like what I would do by shining a, light, a laser yeah. light onto the cavity. I will have to um, account also for the exchange of energy between light and the mechanical oscillator. So if you look at the reduced dynamics of the cavity field, you have an extra element of Nomakovian dynamics, as, as Sophia was, was hinting to, which, in, which comes from the actually you no know, coherent coupling between mechanics and light. So when you look at a sub element of your composite system, at the thermodynamic level, the dynamics is a lot richer than what happens when you look at the optomechanical system as a compound. As a compound, that's clear. I only have the, the influence of the environments, right? So the cold and the hot environment on a composite system. But if I look at the thermodynamics of a components, that's a lot tougher to describe. Thank you. That, that, uh, that makes sense. Um, okay, so I am conscious of time. Um, so if it's okay, Mauro, thank you once again. Thank you so um, much, guys. And virtual thanks and claps um, for, for, for taking part in it giving us that introduction. Um, swiftly moving on to our next speaker um, is, uh, and I, it's a pleasure to invite her and, and introduce her. It's uh, Juliette Marcel. Um, she's a postdoctoral researcher um, working with Janine Spletz-Poyser's group in applied quantum physics um, in Chalmers uh, University of Technology, Gothenburg in Sweden. Um, her research focuses on quantum thermodynamics, uh, both in applied um, to optomechanical systems, but also to electronic transport systems. And uh, so she gained her PhD in 2019 from University of Grenoble, France. Um, and her thesis dissertation, which is very apt for us, uh, for this blog, um, was titled Quantum Thermodynamics and Optomechanics, uh, which in fact won a Springer Thesis Award um, and was of course published then in the Springer Thesis series. So it's a, it's a pleasure to have you, Juliet, um, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, and thanks for, for the introduction. Okay, let me share my screen. Everything's all right, yeah? Okay, so thank you for this opportunity to present uh, this work on the uh, thermodynamics of optomechanical cooling. So this is going to be focused on cavity optomechanics. And as you know, there are many different platforms to implement uh, cavity optomechanics, like uh, setups with a membrane in the middle, uh, on-ship uh, devices, levitated optomechanics. And they have many applications, including ground state cooling of the mechanical resonator, sensing, quantum manipulations, and as uh, 
is the, the interest also for me it's quite promising for exploring stochastic and quantum thermodynamics and that was mostly the, the subject of my phd dissertation for hybrid optomechanical systems uh, but today i'm gonna focus on the thermodynamic analysis of ground state cooling of the mechanical resonator so the goal of optomechanical cooling is to get rid of the thermal fluctuations that are coming from the mechanical environment into the mechanical resonator. So this is a bit like the sketch from Mauro in the previous talk with the mechanical resonator here and the cavity with a mechanical environment and an optical environment. And uh, luckily I have almost the same notations. So as you've seen in the previous slide, there are many different platforms and they have very different parameters, like very different uh, mechanical frequencies, very different like temperatures uh, of the environment and so on. So how can we compare them and quantify the uh, performance of this optomechanical cooling? So that's the question I'm interested in. And uh, first, because I come from thermodynamics, when I say cooling, the first thing I think about is a refrigerator. However, uh, let me explain to you how this thermodynamic picture I'm going to show you for the mechanical cooling is different from the typical thermodynamic refrigerator. So in thermodynamic, when you have a refrigerator, what you want to do actually is cool down the cold path. So you have a working substance, you provide work to this working substance, and that allows you to reverse the heat flow and extract heat from the cold bath. So heat is going from cold to hot. Now for optomechanical cooling, my goal is quite different because I want to cool down the mechanical resonator, which is a small system, not uh, the bath. And I have a hot bath, which is the mechanical environment at some given temperature. And the second bath I have is uh, it's a bit more complicated because it's a photon bath. So it doesn't directly couple to the mechanics. And typically, it's also part of the environment. Like, so let's say it's the lab temperature or the dilution freeze temperature also. So it has, it has the same temperature. So the question is, how can we use this photon bath to cool down the mechanical resonator? So as you expect, the answer is by using optomechanical coupling. And what we do by driving uh, the cavity, which is coupled to the mechanical resonator, is that we engineer an effective cold phonon bath, which has a lower temperature than the hot phonon bath here. And the light field in the cavity can be seen as acting like a heat valve that allows the heat to flow out of the mechanics into the effective cold phonon bath. So here, heat is still flowing from hot to cold, so that's quite different from uh, the refrigerator picture from the previous slide. And obviously, uh, keeping this valve open comes with costs, so the laser power we need to dry the cavity. And the goal here is now to identify performance quantifiers to be able to benchmark up the mechanical pooling in different setups. So in the first part, I'll present you to more detail the standard sideburn cooling scheme in optomechanics and this justify this thermodynamic picture. Then I'll present you two alternative setups that allow to improve the uh, cooling. And finally, I will compare the standard setup and these two improved setups uh, using the thermodynamic analysis to see how efficient the cooling is. So first, back to standard cavity optomechanical cooling. So we look at a single, uh, mechanical mode, which is uh, so a harmonic mode here, which is coupled to its environment with coupling strength gamma. And uh, the temperature in the environment, so it's a hot bath, and there are a lot of thermal fluctuations. Then we also have the cavity. We look again at single mode, harmonic mode, also coupled to its environment, so this time the optical environment. So it's at the same temperature, but the big difference is that the cavity frequency is so much higher than the mechanical one that actually we can neglect the thermal fluctuations in the optical environment and consider that this path is at eff effectively at zero temperature. And then this cavity is also driven by a laser, which is detuned from the cavity. And finally, we have the optomechanical coupling here. So this is the full, uh, full coupling here with G0, the single photon coupling strength. However, in this work, uh, we don't need this uh, full uh, 
optomechanical coupling, and we, we look at the linearized version that Mao mentioned. So in this case, uh, what happened is that we are driving the cavity. So we have a large uh, light field in the cavity with an average amplitude alpha. This uh, creates an average displacement Q bar of the resonator because of radiation pressure here. And then uh, we have this effective detuning of the cavity because the cavity frequency is changed by uh, the mechanical position. So this is a semi-classical steady state. And what we are interested in is only the fluctuations around this steady state. And if we do that, we can neglect uh, the higher order uh, terms and get a nice Gaussian Hamiltonian uh, in this form here. And the important thing is that now we have an effective uh, optomechanical coupling G, which is the single photon coupling G0 times the average, uh, the amplitude of the field in the cavity. So we can increase the optome optomechanical coupling by adding more photons in the cavity, which is quite convenient given that G0 is typically very small. Okay, so now how do we use this system to uh, cool down the mechanical resonator? So let me give you this nice uh, scattering picture of the process, which is valid only in the weak coupling limit. So when the optomechanical coupling is a lot smaller than the mechanical frequency and the optical loss rate. So the, uh, we are in this state with P photons in the cavity and phonons in the mechanics. And there are three possible scattering processes. The first one is just the cavity absorb a photon from the laser. So it doesn't change the mechanics and we just don't care about that. The second process is the Stokes process where one photon from the laser becomes a photon at lower frequency and one photon in the mechanics. So it's heating up the mechanics. And then the last process is the anti-Stokes process in blue here where one photon plus one photon from the mechanics gives a photon at higher energy and higher frequency. And this is the process we are interested in because it's destroying phonons and therefore cooling down the mechanical resonator. So to target this process and enhance it, uh, what can be done is to uh, make the cavity, so the line shape of the cavity here is in gray, uh, resonant with this anti stokes process. And that allows to uh, enhance it and attenuate at the same time the uh, Stokes process and that's why it's important in this case to be in the resolve sideband regime so that we can really resolve this, uh, these three peaks here. Okay, so that's how the cooling works. I just want to emphasize here that even if I will talk a lot about the weak coupling regime and resolve sidebands, uh, all the results in the article, so the reference uh, is here, uh, are actually valid beyond this regime. Okay, so now, Let's stay a bit longer in the weak coupling uh, regime because there is this nice thermodynamic picture I want to present you. So because the coupling is weak, we can trace out the optical part and just focus on the uh, evolution of just the mechanics here, given by this density operator. And this reduced evolution is given by a Lindblad uh, master equation. So this is the Hamiltonian part of the evolution. In red, there is the contribution, the dissipation coming from the mechanical environment, so from the hot bath. And the interesting part is that when we trace out the optical part, we get a term which has exactly the same shape as the term coming from the mechanical environment. So just with different coefficients. And that shows that the uh, cavity plus optical environment acts like an effective cold phonon bath with a coupling strength gamma opt and uh, an average number of phonons, n opt, which is finite. And also interestingly, this coupling strength is proportional to the number of photons in the cavity. And therefore, the light field in the cavity really acts like a heat valve that allows uh, the resonator to couple to the cold bath. And therefore, this justifies this heat valve pictures, uh, picture I've showed you. Okay. So now how can we use this thermodynamic picture to uh, analyze the performance of the optomechanical cooling? So first of all, everybody looks at the steady state phonon number because it's directly related to the effective temperature of the mechanics. And in the weak coupling limit, it has this nice expression where we clearly see the contribution of the hot bath and of the cold bath. But it doesn't tell us the full story about the cooling. So we also looked into the evacuated heat flow, which is this uh, JC here. 
And it's kind of analogous to the cooling power in a refrigerator. And it has this expression where you clearly see uh, that it depends on the difference between the number of phonons in the hot bath and in the cold bath. And finally, to get the benefit cost ratio, we define the full cooling efficiency as this evacuated heat flow, so what we want, divided by the cost, which is in this case, the laser power we need to drive the cavity here. Okay. So all these expressions are in the weak coupling limit, but they are like full expression in the article if you're interested. And the next step now that we have these performance quantifiers is uh, to use them to compare different setups, including setups that actually improve the standard sideband cooling scheme. So let me present them uh, to you. So the first one involves squeeze light and the second one a funnel mirror. So first, let's understand why there is a finite temperature in the cold bath in the standard setup. So this is, again, the standard uh, optomechanical uh, cooling setup. And I told you we can neglect uh, the thermal fluctuation in the optical bath because uh, the mechanical frequency is so high. However, we still have some vacuum noise. So the vacuum noise goes inside the cavity, create fluctuations on the optical quadratures in the cap cavity. And because this position quadrature of the cavity couples to the mechanical position uh, here, due to the optomechanical coupling, then this creates noise also in the resonator, and that's what's responsible for the non-zero temperature of the cold phonon bath. Which has, uh, so this is the average number of phonon in the cold bath. So now how can we improve that and lower the temperature in the cold bath? We can do that by using squeeze noise instead of vacuum noise. So this was uh, proposed in the, this article here. And what uh, we can do then is to choose the angle of the squeezing so that the squeeze quadrature is the one, uh, like so that the, we can minimize actually the uh, noise on the position quadrature here of the cavity that couples to the mechanics. And if we also optimize the squeezing level, what we can get is a zero temperature called phonon bath and therefore uh, get a lower phonon number, lower temperature in the mechanics. So that's one way of improving the cooling. Another way is not to act, act on the noise, but to act on the Stokes process. So if you remember, we have this uh, Stokes process, which is heating up the mechanics. But if we change the line shape of the cavity and make it asymmetrical by using a frequency dependent mirror, so a final mirror, what we get is this line shape. And so as you, you can see that it further suppresses the source process. And therefore, it modifies both the coupling gamma up to the cold bath and the effective phonon number in the cold bath. And it was proposed in, in this article. So that's the other alternative. So now, how do they perform uh, in terms of cooling? Let's use uh, this thermodynamic analysis to see it. So first, let's look at the phonon number. So this is the phonon number in uh, the fluctuation of the mechanics as a function of cooperativity. So cooperativity is the optomechanical coupling strength divided by the coupling to the baths. And these curves were done for these experimental uh, parameters that corresponds to this uh, setup. And the first thing we can see is that ground state cooling is possible because we are actually here. This setup is in the uh, resolved sideband regime. So the standard setup in blue can reach a uh, phonon number below one. Then the second thing is that the squeeze light setup and the phonon mirror setup allow to reach lower phonon numbers. So they do provide some improvements on the cooling. But what about the evacuated heat flow now? What you can see in this figure is that the evacuated heat flow is basically really similar for all three setups. It has a linear behavior for small cooperativities that you can see in the inset here, and then it saturates. So, and the saturation value is actually the same for all three setups because it's, it comes from the limited incoming heat flow from the hot bath and the hot bath is the same for all three setups. And it gives us a complementary picture on the cooling because as you can see now, we have a saturation at high cooperativity and not a divergence like for the phonon number. And finally, the efficiency. So if we divide this incoming heat flow, uh, evacuated heat flow by the laser power, what we see is that the phonon mirror in green here has a, a large extra cost. And that's because we need some laser, extra laser power to build an average field 
in the final mirror mode too. So we have one extra harmonic mode. And the second thing is that for the squeezing, it looks like it's the same as for the uh, standard setup. However, it's because we have not uh, computed the exact cost of generating the squeezing. But if we know the exact experimental setup, then we could know how many, how much more laser power we need to uh, generate the squeezing. And so we also expect uh, a lower efficiency. So this efficiency doesn't tell us, however, uh, about the efficiency of the conversion process from photonic so from phononic heat to photonic heat because we are evacuating phonons in a, in the end in the optical environment so we also define a conversion efficiency in the article but i don't have time here to give you uh, details but it also gives some further insights so to conclude i've showed you that we can understand uh, optomechanical cooling uh, with a thermodynamic heat valve picture where we are engineering a cold phonon bath using uh, optomechanics. And this thermodynamic picture allows us to define uh, benchmark uh, performance quantifiers beyond the phonon number to understand the efficiency of the cooling. And we use these tools to study alternative setups using squeeze light and a phonon mirror. And we've seen that uh, they allow to reach lower phonon number, but this com comes with an extra co cost because we need extra resources to do that. So we will find all the details in the article. And in Outlooks, what we are currently looking at is to apply this insight to uh, more generic uh, optomechanical thermal machines. And we're also looking into optomechanics with two final mirrors, especially with uh, the experimental part of this uh, collaboration, because they are going to have such a system in the lab at Chalmers. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. And thanks also my collaborators on this project. Thank you, Juliet, um, for that great talk. Um, <clears throat> are there any questions? Oh, yeah, and virtual claps <laughs> uh, all around. We'll just give it a second. I'll just start to see if the questions come through. Uh, so while we're waiting for that, um, so Juliet, I, I guess the, the thing I want to quickly ask, uh, just a clarification, is um, the beginning when you talk about um, the cavity being the, you know, the, uh, you're essentially, yeah, if you go back actually to, to the image. Um, uh, yeah, over here, that's it, the valve okay. essentially. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, that's all. So, so I guess is what I, maybe I missed the point when you were referring to this is that, um, is there a way for it to go the other way or is this just the nature of how things are and, and you can't, um, have uh, so right now heat is flowing from the photon, phonon bath and, and the traditional route for a for a refrigerator is obviously reversed mm. but is that possible at all um, or is that just something you have to live with uh, okay I, I was really interested in looking at uh, like siphon cooling so in this mm -hmm. case uh, really you're like um, what you're you're doing the work to create the cold bath so you, you automatically you have heat flowing from hot to cold because you're not doing anything to um, reverse the heat flow. So um, uh, I, I guess the, the 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 other question is that if if um, the the yeah okay no that's that's so it, it, it's not possible i guess maybe i've missed this um yeah because mm. or you would uh, mm. because i'm always on this sideburn where you can do the cooling so mm. so i so because I, there are have, ways to have... for example directly address the phone on part as well using um so the internal states of the mechanical state, right? That's what's causing. Uh, sorry. Uh, so what, what is the physical phonon bath here when you refer to, to in your model? Okay, the, the phonon bath, the, um, like the hot bath or the- Yeah, the, the hot bath, sorry, yes. The, the hot bath is 
yeah, in my case, it's just like a, it's a thermal environment. So it's uh, gas and it's like the I'm not looking at a precise uh, experimental implementation mm -hmm. for for me, it's just like a, a phonon reservoir with a thermal distribution. Okay, that's fine, that makes sense. Okay, um, so I'm just conscious of time. We are slightly out of that. Um, I think there's someone who's raised his hand. Oh, Sophia. Hi, so if you want to finish, um, um, I had a very... Um, yeah, no, go ahead, go ahead. We can okay. take one question. Quickly. Okay, <laughs> so hi. Um, thank you so much for the talk. Um, I, I was may maybe I missed this, um, and maybe this is a bit of a nebulous question. But um, uh, my understanding, when when modeling like uh, mechanics and optics separately for of the mechanical systems, um, that in the weak coupling limit you can describe them as separate persons and, and have essentially a Lindlar equation for for yes. each. Uh, but in the strong coupling limit. Um, this Lindblad equation has to be like modified with, with some dressed dissipators to take into account the fact that, that there is strong coupling. Um, and I, I think you mentioned that your methods were also valid in the strong coupling limit. So I was curious um, as to oh, yes. so how that comes. Yes. When I say strong coupling, I mean strong effective coupling, which is oh, okay. quite yeah. different. Uh, yeah, sorry That's about a good that. Point. It, no, no, no. It's, but it's like, good. to be clear, yes, it's strong effective coupling. Mm -hmm. And I'm not like to, to look at, uh, to, to do all the plots I did, I don't use the, exactly the Lindblad master equation. I use, okay. long, uh, I use the Langevin, Langevin equation. Oh, okay, yeah. But, uh, but I'm so, not technically hmm. looking at real uh, strong coupling, just effective strong coupling. It's a good question whether the same sort of um, like difficulties arrive in, uh, arise in the strong coupling limit, which I, which I don't know actually. Um, and I'm also not sure how it translates to Langevin. So uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Sophia, for that. Um, and uh, Juliet, I think we're sort of uh, out of time, unfortunately. Yes. Um, but thank you, Juliet and, and Mauro, who had to unfortunately head out early um, for giving us a, a great introduction to the, to the book and really interesting research. I hopefully um, inspired all of us to think about optomechanics in the thermodynamics context. Um, so I just want to quickly, before everyone goes, uh, share what's happening next week. Um, just bear with me one second. I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> so I'm very, very excited to say next week we'll have a panel discussion, as is with all the formats. Um, we'll be focused on uh, what is um, optomechanical machines and what that actually means. Um, a lot of the discussion will be um, very general, but also applicable to other uh, within optomechanics. Um, it's it's an honor to have Janet Anders, Raul Rika, Ram Uzdin, and Nikolai Kiesel. Um, and the discussion will be chaired by James um, Millen. Um, and so I hope you can all join for that and then keep an eye out for the emails and links. Um, until then, I uh, hope to see you soon. All right. Take care. Bye. Okay, thank you. Bye. Um, can uh, shut the live feed.